Hello and welcome to CPH Session 19, Inferential Statistics, Making Comparisons and Conclusions from Data. This is Part D, Hypothesis Testing and P-Values. In this section, we'll talk about the process we go through to test research questions using statistical models. And then we'll define the meaning of a P-value, including what it is not. I'll start with an overview of how to test a research question. So first I'll give you an overview of the process and the outputs that we get from it. And once I've given that overview, I'll give you an example how, of how to put that in practice. So the process goes like this. First, we make initial observations. Uh, from those initial observations, we can then develop a research question. The research question is based on some theory, and we can make a hypothesis, which is like an answer to our research question. Second, we have to choose a model that can explain our hypothesis. Uh, by fitting a statistical model, uh, we can develop an alternative hypothesis. At the same time, we'll develop a null hypothesis, which is the opposite of the alternative hypothesis. Third, we do the research, and from that we get the data. Fourth, we have to select and execute a statistical test. The test we choose depends on the type of data, the sample size, and the question that we're asking. And the output of our test is sometimes a test statistic, uh, which we then use to find a p-value. And in some cases, the test directly gives us the p-value. Finally, we analyze the results. We compare our p-values against our predetermined significance level, and we make a statement about the meaning of our results. Okay, so let's use an example. I'll take you through an experiment done by Sir Ronald Fisher, who was monumental in inferential statistics. Fisher was British, so he liked to drink tea. Now, normally, he would pour his tea into the cup and then pour the milk on top. However, one time at a cafe, a waiter added the milk first and then poured the tea on top. And he was with a woman, and she threw a fit. She claimed that she could tell the difference in the taste. So from this observation, Fisher made a research question and a hypothesis. His question was, can this woman correctly identify the cups in which milk was added before tea? And so he wrote a null hypothesis. His null hypothesis was that the ability to correctly identify the cups was due to random chance. In other words, she would just be getting lucky if she could get it correctly. And in his book from 1935, he didn't have an alternative hypothesis. That concept uh, was actually added later by another statistician named Pearson, uh, and he was another monumental statistician, and he had conflicting views to Fisher. And so Fisher designed and executed a research experiment, and to do that, he made eight cups of tea. Into four of the cups, he poured milk first. And into the other four cups, he poured the tea first. And so he let the woman know that half of the cups had the milk poured in first, and half of them had the tea poured in first, and then the milk on top. And he then served them to her in a random order. And so she was supposed to identify which cups she thought had the milk poured in first. And then Fisher compared her guesses to the reality. And so in this case, uh, Fisher chose a statistical test. Well, actually, he invented his own at that time. Uh, and we now call that Fisher's exact test. And so this could be one option that we would choose as our statistical test that we would use to analyze our results. And we can understand the process that he went through to be like this. So because there's eight cups and four out of those eight have milk poured first, we can create 70 possible orders or permutations of the cups. So for example, one possible order would be milk, milk, tea, tea, milk, milk, tea, tea. And there's 70 possible orders that we could come up with that we could give to her. And if we look at all of the 70 possible ways and we ask, what's the probability of getting none of them correct? Uh, the milk correct? If I correctly identifying one of them, two of them, three of them, or what's the probability of getting all four correct? 
So of those 70 possible orders of milk and tea that she could come up with, only one out of those 70 perfectly matches the real order. So she would have a 1 in 70 chance of correctly guessing if she was only guessing. So Fisher's null hypothesis was that it is just luck, and she's only doing it by guessing. So if she got all four correct, there would only be a 1 in 70 chance that she could do it under his assumed model, his null hypothesis. Um, it wasn't reported in his book at the time, but it turns out, according to a book that was written later by another author, that this woman was, was able to correctly identify all four of the milk cups. And so from that, we can say that the probability of this outcome occurring under our assumed model, that is random guessing, is 1 out of 70 or 1.4%. That would be the p-value. So next, he compared this probability of 1.4% to a threshold that he set, which was 5%. He said if the p-value is less than 5%, he was willing to reject his null hypothesis as being unlikely. He was willing to reject the possibility that she was just doing it by luck. And so his interpretation was, was that this lady's ability to identify cups in which milk was poured first was probably not due to random luck. So let's summarize. In hypothesis testing, we ask ourselves, if we create a model, a null hypothesis explanation, and we assume that it is true, how likely is it that we get the results that we find. We compute this probability using a chosen statistical test. And then the resulting probability that we get is called the p-value. And if p is small, it's unlikely that we got this result under the assumptions that we put together in our null hypothesis. And in that case, we reject our null hypothesis. In hypothesis testing, we can either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject it. We cannot confirm our alternative hypothesis. In Fisher's tea drinking experiment, he could not confirm that the lady was able to correctly identify cups in which the milk was poured before the tea. He could only say that it's really unlikely to get all eight cups correctly identified if it's just by luck. He rejected his null hypothesis. So finally, some notes about p-values. A p-value is defined as the probability under a specified statistical model that a statistical summary of the data so for example, the sample mean difference between two compared groups would be equal to or more extreme than what you observed. P-values are not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. In Fisher's experiment, he did not say that there is a 1.4% probability that the woman guesses about T. What he did say was that there's a 1.4% chance that she could get the result. She could get them all correct if it was just by guessing only. And that, which is what his hypothetical null hypothesis explanation was. And that's what he was testing. And finally, while you can illustrate statistical significance using a p-value, that's not the same thing as scientific significance. P-values cannot tell you the size of the effect. They can't tell you the strength of the evidence, nor can they tell you the importance of your result. And I can tell you that P-values have been abused. Uh, please be sure to read the two articles about P-values that were assigned to you, and they're available uh, on the Google Drive under the Readings folder for session 19. And what you'll see is that from some of this abuse, there are journals out there that are beginning to ban the use of p-values in their publications. And so in the remaining parts of session 19, I'll show you how to correctly choose your statistical test for some of the most common situations, and also how to execute those tests. That's it for part D.